Great. So nice to see you all this evening. Uh, lecture 7, 8, 9 tonight. Uh, eventually, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of kenosis, and so we'll explain that in a little bit. But before that, we have an assignment due tonight, and so um, uh, we're just going to give everyone who has a paper an opportunity of reading, and, um, and then we'll get to our lectures. So, uh, but let's start with a word of prayer, okay? Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. It's such a blessing to be able to get together and spend some time uh, in your word, and I just pray, Father, as we learn more and more about, um, even tonight, about errors that, uh, and heresies that have cropped up, that we would guard ourselves uh, against um, so much wickedness that does arise in doctrinal error, and we would uh, keep our eyes focused upon truth, and as we do so, Lord, that we would uh, learn to appreciate more and more uh, your Son, the Lord Jesus, and who he was and what he accomplished for us. I pray, Father, that you'd bless our time together tonight, that it would be very profitable for all of us, uh, enjoyable, um, but also, dear Father, that we would learn some things um, that help us in the work of the ministry. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All righty. Well, tonight's assignment was, of course, to choose one of the isms uh, and uh, to give a, just a one-page one page brief explanation. This is not an academic exercise, but I hopefully give you the opportunity of... of of digging in a little bit to understand that you know these heresies were out there and some of them still are out there and um, and understand that um, you know we have a responsibility to make sure we know the difference between truth and error and so that's what the exercise is for just so you can appreciate some of these isms and so um, who, who wants to go first thank you brother Stephen for volunteering <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Come on up here. I'm just going to get out of the way and uh, let you have at it. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. State your name because you're on camera. My name is Stephen Lessa, and we're going to be talking about Endianism. Uh, they were a Jewish sect of people that likely arose just after Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And continued at least up until the third century. Some uh, people think further into the fourth century. Uh, pretty much everybody who I read who was talking about them said that there wasn't a whole lot known about them, and a lot of what is known about them is just compiled from all the people who wrote bad things about them. Uh, so they were legalistic in their practice. They believed in uh, keeping the law, they were uh, they were vegetarians. They um, they had all these sorts of washing rituals that they uh, believed were all essential for you to keep. Um, but it, it's weird because at the same time they rejected a lot of of laws. So they believed the law is essential for for salvation, but but also they rejected animal sacrifices, which like that's a huge chunk of the law. They rejected the official priesthood that made those animal sacrifices. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a, a strange thing about them. Their name is a Hebrew word that means the poor or poor ones, and uh, that's because their, I, I guess their most visible characteristic was that they were, they kind of vowed a life of poverty. Uh, they believed that God wanted them to be poor. So, the only thing poorer than the Ebionites themselves was their view of Jesus Christ. Mm. To their credit, they did believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and um, they did believe that he was that prophet that is talked about in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, but as far as what I was able to find, that's about where uh, agreement with Scripture stops. Uh, in the first century, we know there's a lot of Gnosticism going on. We We've talked about how uh, John and, and Paul wrote against, uh, against that belief of Gnosticism. And uh, people who I was uh, reading, this one guy, Dr. Uh, McDonald, he was from London College of the Bible. He said that uh, you could kind of compare it to the other end of, like if Gnosticism was one end of the spectrum, uh, Ebionism is the other end. It's Gnosticism, lots of emphasis on the spiritual, spiritual good, physical bad. Ebionism said that Jesus was purely a man. So 
much more emphasis on the physical. He was a man who became God, and so it rejects the deity of Christ. Um, it's kind of the great-grandfather of other isms, like Arianism, uh, believing that he was, he was not, uh, not deity. Um, it rejects the uh, virgin birth of Christ. So just, they, they would have just said that Mary and Joseph's, uh, that, that Jesus was the natural child of Mary and Joseph. So it makes him just a man, and he was such a faithful man that he was adopted. The word adoptionism kept getting thrown around in a lot of these articles. And so he was uh, adopted by God at his baptism uh, because of his own faithfulness. So it kind of reminded me of Mormonism, where mm -hmm. you, uh, where Jesus became something higher than he was. So Mormonism, you become, Jesus became God. Ebionism, Jesus started as a man and he became the Son of God. So that's what I found. Excellent. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Appreciate that. All righty. Next. I'll go back. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Make sure you tell everybody who you are. Hello. I'm Rachel. Um, I'm going to do adoptionism, and I want to go next because you just talked about Ebionites, and that's part of this. Um, can I read it? You can do whatever you need to do. <laughs> um, the pre existence of Christ is clearly shown in the Bible. In John 1 1, it states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the first century, there were several groups of people that did not believe this to be true. The Ebionites, the Nazarenes, and the Elphazites. They believed in a doctrine called adoptionism. Adoptionism is the belief that Jesus of Nazareth became the Son of God by adoption. Um, adoptionism, um, some believed that the timing of his adoption was at his baptism, and others um, taught that he was adopted at his resurrection or his ascension. Adoptionism is sometimes called dynamic monarchianism, which denies the pre-existence of Jesus as the Christ, but doesn't deny his ultimate divinity. Um, adoptionism teaches that Jesus was born human and then later earned his title, God's son, because he lived a righteous life. The Ebionites were an adoptionist group that originated in and around Palestine. The Ebionite literature closely resembled the Gospel of Matthew without the virgin birth. They taught that Jesus was the Messiah and one true prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18.15. Um, he was not born as the prophet, but instead became the prophet because he lived a righteous life and followed the Mosaic law. This religious group probably started around the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, AD 70, and may have lasted into the fourth century. Most people that believed adoptionism will always deny the virgin birth. They believe that Jesus was the natural born son of Joseph. They would not have believed verses like Matthew 1.23 and Luke 1.27. And when they read Isaiah 7.14 and saw that the Messiah was, um, would be born of a virgin, they would say that the writer meant a young woman would conceive. Um, John 3.16 tells us that Jesus was not the adopted Son of God, but the only begotten Son of God. We can see also in the passages, um, in those passages, that Jesus was not chosen out of the world, but was sent into the world from heaven, that the world through him might be saved. Excellent. Very nice. Thank you very much. A lot of good information in there. All righty. What else? I will read a mind. Okay. <laughs> See, I thought you guys were going to like work together and do the same thing, but... Uh... We were going to, but then she said, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen exactly. She, <laughs> but she didn't want you dragging her grade down. Yeah, right? Exactly. That's what I said. You're going to you're gonna get like 100 and I'll get like a 75. So. Okay. We'll run it through Grammarly and see what happens. <laughs> I'm Sean McGonigal, um, and I did my paper on doceticism. You say that Dose, you doceticism. Are, uh, yeah. um, During the first century, the Gnostic teachers of John's time had tried to infiltrate the church with their false teachings. The Gnostics believed that all physical matter is evil. They took this belief so far as to say that there wasn't a creation until after the fall of man. Because without sin, there was nothing physical. Because they believed that anything physical was evil, they could not reconcile a perfect and sinless God taking on human flesh. 
The fact that Jesus, as a human, would have to go through the birth process, be taken care of by a mother, and even have normal human bodily functions further complicated things for the Gnostics. The doctrine, doctrine of Docetism helps to explain how the Gnostic teachers were able to reconcile Jesus with their belief system. Docetism was a very important part of the Gnostic religion. The name Docetism comes from the Greek dokian, meaning to seem. Docetism was the heretical teaching that denies the incarnation of Jesus. Because of the heretical conclusion, Docetists say that Christ's body was not human, but either a phantasm or of real but celestial substance, and that therefore his sufferings were not real but only apparent. They deny the entire gospel of Jesus, saying Jesus was just a figment of the imagination. He did not walk on the earth, he did not die, and he did not physically rise from the dead. Even as early as the first century, there were false teachers that denied Jesus' physical existence. The Apostle John, who was alive to see and to touch uh, Jesus, had to write a warning against the people, against people that would teach that Jesus had not come in the flesh. In 1 John 4, 1 through 3, John lets the reader know that they cannot have a right relationship with God while denying the incarnation of Jesus. If we have the Spirit of God, we will acknowledge the person of Jesus as explained in the Bible. If we cannot acknowledge Jesus in the flesh, we are Antichrist. There you go. All right. Thank you, brother. All righty. Well, you were looking down to avoid eye contact. Classic move. Very classic. <laughs> Carlos, A, or Pi, whatever way you want to go. <laughs> so I actually did mind that wasn't on the list. Uh, Marconiism. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Yeah, yeah. Marconiism? Oh, yeah, that sounds good. I yeah, like we'll, we'll accept it as yeah, official now. Yeah, yeah. So this one, it branches off so much. It was fascinating. I had to stop myself. I think I was about four or five websites in and said, this is going to turn into an essay, so I stopped. I cut it down to almost one page. But uh, this guy, Marconi, is, uh, or Marconi of Sinope, pretty much early second century decided the Old Testament God is too wrathful, vengeful, he likes to kill. We don't want to follow that guy. Old New Testament, God the Father, He's the true God. They're two different people. Uh, he referred to the Old Testament God as Demiurge, which comes from Greek, the Greeks. Uh, lesser God, like the creator, but he's not the true God in power. And the, the, uh, I started researching, and the way he looked at Jesus is he wasn't sent to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. That's actually someone else, as someone else is going to be the fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. Some of the people said that hasn't even come yet. But they look at Jesus as coming to pretty much use of power from this God, from this other God. To bring people from wrathful, vengeful God to a loving God who will save you. And it was just very interesting. In order to justify this, uh, he ended up making his own version of the Bible. Old Testament, out the window. Cut it all out. Took the New Testament. He said not all this falls in line with my beliefs either. So he ended up with 11 books of the Bible. Um, an abridged version of Luke. And most of the letters of Paul, except for three that he did not agree with. The pastoral ones. He cut out 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Because they had too many references to Old Testament for him. He cut them out. And uh, he, I just looked more and more into this. He, he didn't like having to be saved from sin. He, he didn't want that to be the thing. And then he also looked at Paul as the only successful apostle. All the other apostles were they're Jewish. They, they let their Jewish traditions ruin them because they held to some of those beliefs. They held to the law. They, they, they were saved, but they held to the law, so they were corrupted. We don't want them. Paul is the only good one in his eyes. 
Paul's the only one who worked perfectly with Christ. And he also holds to the fact that Christ didn't come in the form of man. Or he came in the form of man, but he wasn't man. And he ended up starting a whole church because he got kicked out of the church. It, it, apparently, they didn't know what to do with him. They kicked him out. He, they view him as probably one of the biggest threats to the early church. Because he started multiple churches because he was already a rich man. And he got a lot of people because who doesn't want to believe in a God who loves you no matter what and your sin doesn't matter. So, of course, lots of people went to him. But he looked at this Old Testament God as a lesser God, but still a God. Again, goes against even New Testament. I don't know how it justifies it. It doesn't really, doesn't really seem like he does. He just kind of cut out any verses that didn't work with him. Um, he looked at God the Father as the only true God. I couldn't find anything about if he viewed Jesus as God or just the Son of God. Because every reference I see is Son of God. There's never a reference that says he's actually God. So it's kind of interesting. But yeah, he only looked at Jesus as he didn't really need to die on the cross for sin. Because he didn't really view wrath as needed. Jesus kind of came died just as an act of faith that we would believe that he was the better God. And that's really all it came down to. Mm. Like I said, I ended up stopping myself because I don't think you guys want to hear me do a five-page <laughs> essay either. <laughs> Pastor, I probably recommend you don't re research this because you're like me and you're going to keep reading and reading. Because <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I'm going to read more into this because I was actually loving how yeah. crazy these theories got. And the fact that this guy ended up starting a whole church that drew away from Christians wanted to believe in, you know, you're not, you don't have to be under the law, but you still have to be saved from the sin. He didn't want to view sin. He, all that fell under an Old Testament wrathful God. And yeah, it's all there. You know, what's interesting, you know, you're talking about the fact that he was a rich guy and to start his own religion. When you, as soon as you said that, that reminded me so much of Harold Camping. Mm -hmm. um, because he was, uh, he made a fortune in the construction industry. I think he was, uh, he was, he was an engineer at a construction firm. And, um, you know, if you're familiar with his heresies about end times, mm -hmm. and he, you know, uh, I guess he had a Presbyterian type background. He was a Calvinistic, but, uh, you know, he got, you know, it's like, I'll start my own religion. It's exactly what he did. Yeah. And he drew so many people into his, you know, family radio, you know, Harold Camping, um, way of thinking and uh, just let a lot of people astray it's just you know so that yeah. that way of thinking really hasn't changed people are still oh, yeah. doing that same thing today well he also had a lot of influence a lot of um, they say his father was actually a bishop in the church okay and some say he might have been a bishop there's no confirmation of that yeah. but he owned a docking like a shipping dock okay so that's where he made all of his money yeah, and, yeah the power position he kind of Easily drew a lot of people. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brother yeah. Carlos. Appreciate that. Hey, Brother Jeremy, what you got back there? Besides the Mountain Dew. <laughs> you have that. Alrighty. Great. Thank you. All right. I also was doing Ebionism. Um, it's going to sound a lot like some of the other stuff you heard already. <laughs> yeah. The Ebionism um, denies the divinity and virgin birth of Christ. Jesus was considered a wise man, recognized as being from the line of David and was even recognized as being a human messiah, but not as God. Ebionism accepted Jesus as the son of Mary and Joseph, who then was elected to be the son of God at his baptism. They also held true to, to uh, Judaism belief that God is one and emphasized obedience to the Mosaic law. The doctrine taught through Ebionism that Jesus is man is strongly supported throughout God's word, 1 Timothy 2.5, which speaks of the man Christ Jesus. Also, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh. And Philippians 2.7 tells us he was made in the likeness of man. Ebionism went wrong in their perception that Christ was not God. This teaching ignores Christ's role in creation. Um, John 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1.26, examples on that. and Or the uh, Christophanies found in the Old Testament, such as what we find in Daniel 3.25. If Christ were merely a man, he would not have been existent. Uh, exi he would not have existed for these events to take place. 
Ebionism believed that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies in Deuteronomy 18.15, but did not believe he was born of a virgin or the Son of God. This teaching contradicts Isaiah's prophecies in Isaiah 7.14, referring to the virgin birth and calling his name Emmanuel, God with us. If Christ were not God, he would not be able to pay the redemption of man because he is begotten of God. He was not of the line of sin through Adam, Romans 5.12. Because of his deity, John 10, 30, he, he was found righteous for the redemption of man and his humanity. He took on the death of the cross for our sins. It is important that we recognize Christ as both human and divine at the same time. Believers in this early church heresy, as many today were willing to accept God's word when it agreed with their thinking, but would not when it did not support their views. They even excluded and rewrote the gospels to make it agree with them. It's imperative that our views be founded upon God's word, for his word is truth. John 17, 17. Amen. Well, thank you there, brother. I appreciate that. You know, it's uh, interesting. You both, uh, a couple of times I've heard about, uh, you know, altering the Bible to, to fit views. Anybody ever heard of the Jefferson Bible? Yeah. Okay. What do you know about the Jefferson Bible? It's We're just, talking about Thomas Jefferson, by the way. It's just the, the moral teachings of Christ. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. So what he did was... Uh, if you would, kind of took a pen knife out and cut out the things he didn't like, yeah. uh, especially the miracles. He cut out all the miracles and um, stitched together uh, more of like a moral teaching type of thing. And so, uh, uh, you know, Jefferson did a lot of great things for our country, but as far as his Christian faith, you know, he was, you know, it was like, take it, cut, cut what you want, leave the rest out. And, uh, and so a lot of people have done that over the years. I want to... Um, uh, this is a, a, a theology work of Christian theology by uh, Erickson. Um, what's his name? First name Milford. Yeah, Millard. Millard. Millard Erickson. And uh, this is another one of those books that uh, anytime I see copy used copies, I always pick them up and give them away. It's an excellent, it's an excellent theological work. I, I don't, I forget what his background is as far as church goes, but he has, he's done a fantastic job. What I like about Erickson's work is, is that he always provides um, not only statements of doctrine, but also also goes back through and talks about um, a lot of the, um, well, the heresies, of course, but anytime he talks about a doctrine, he always talks about, you know, who, who is it that opposes these doctrines and why, you know, different positions and things like that. So he's got a lot of, a lot of great things. And as you can see, it's pretty thorough. And uh, I just wanted to read uh, just a little bit of what he says about some of these uh, sections here, like here's the section on, on uh, Ebionism and Arianism, and uh, this is all is in the um, this is his Christology section, and so um, he he divides it into the uh, deity and humanity of Christ, but uh, like for instance with the Ebionism, and, and uh, of course we learned a little bit about that tonight. Jesus was according to the Ebionites. An ordinary man possessed of unusual but not superhuman or supernatural gifts of righteousness and wisdom. He was the um, uh, predestined Messiah, although in a rather natural or human sense. The baptism was the significant event in Jesus' life, for it was then that Christ, dis dis that Christ descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And of course, he goes on and talks quite a bit about that. And um, Arianism, of course, is mentioned here about the creation of Jesus. Um, Docetis, uh, Docet, Docetism, <laughs> you said it right, brother, I believe. And uh, this, uh, this centers around Jesus only seeming to be human. And, you know, one of the things, you know, now we've kind of talked about this quite a bit. You know, when you think about Jesus, you know, we have... Um, Kind of this the scale, if you would, and uh, you know you got deity, and um, and you got humanity, and you know when you think about Jesus, um, you know you, you kind of have this scale of all these all these doctrines. You know, uh, you know was uh, you know was Jesus? You know, I mean, what was he? If this is. Uh, you know, there's 100% and there's zero, okay? Uh, and, you, you know, you have things like, um, 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 I, I know, uh, no, I don't think anybody, well, I didn't hear anybody talking about Nestorianism. And, uh, you know, you're talking about like Nestorianism where Jesus had uh, two very distinct persons in one body. 
And so he had, you know, he, he they had the body of Jesus, but you had, you know, these two individual persons inside of it that were not connected with one another. It was almost like a schizophrenic Jesus, you know. And and, and you had this idea, well, he was kind of like, you know, he was kind of like 50% human and, and 50% deity. And, and, you know, that, that, that just doesn't fly, you know. And then you have things like, um, like, you know, um, those, uh, those, <laughs> I'm going to struggle with that. And uh, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. But he, he seemed to be human, right? But he wasn't. That's how they would hold it. So, you know, with that, you got this, well, he's, a, he's, he's, he's all God, but he only seems human. So you got this, like this, you know, 100% and this zero down here. And that, that doesn't fly either, you know? And, and, then, and then you have like Arianism, which, you know, Jesus was, is a created being. So he's down here on the deity scale, but he's way up here on the, on the humanity scale. And so you just got these things all over the place. And um, I mean, the reality of it is, I mean, where, where should the numbers be? Let me just ask you, where, where should the numbers be? 100%. On which side? On which one? Both. Yeah. He is 100% God and 100% man. And, and that's, that's, the, that's where, doctrinally, that's where we're at. And uh, you know that's 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 hard to explain. It's hard to get get your hand. We're going to talk about that tonight with this, but it's hard to get your get your arms around that. But you know any anything else, you are doing disservice to to who Jesus is. It's that it's that complete mixture of deity and humanity together in one person. And, and so uh, what. What these isms are doing is trying to figure out how you have humanity and divinity together, and and, and they're just playing with the scale to try to try to get it to work in their own minds, and and so what they end up with is is something less than who the who, who Jesus in the Bible is. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, kenosis tonight, and so uh, we're going to take a short break so we can get some more Fiji water and uh, yeah, get into our next, uh, next lecture tonight.